So we have said that uh, every attack starts with a distinguisher. And we also said that differential cryptanalysis actually checks the effect of small differences on the input and looks at the output to see how it changes. So uh, now it is a good time to see a practical example. So in our case study, we will uh, focus on differential cryptanalysis of present. So our aim is to uh, generate a differential distinguisher for a present. So in order to uh, see how the input is affected, input difference is affected at the output, we have to see how uh, what happens when we introduce a small difference on the input. So we want to see how each layer of an SPN cipher like present affects the input difference that we have introduced. So let's recall what the present cipher was about. So recall that it was a, a block cipher, which is still a, a lightweight cryptography standard, ISS standard. The block size is 64 bits. So in our picture, every line represents a single bit. There are two key length variants, 80 bit and 128 bits. So the key schedule algorithm changes uh, according to your choice of key length, but uh, each key schedule generates, uh, uh, generates round keys, which are 64 bits. So each round key is XOR with the input here. So you start with an initial key XOR, which is the round key XOR with 64 bits. Then you apply the uh, substitution layer. In this case, it is an application of an S box 16 times in parallel. So all of these S boxes are the same. The table is represented here. So four bit input is replaced with the four bit output uh, with respect to this table. And this is then the bits are permuted. For instance, the rightmost bit stays uh, at the same place. So in the next round, this will go here. But the first bit goes to the position of 16, which is here. So in the next round, it will come here. So this is a single round of present. So we keep this, uh, repeat this picture 31 times. But of course, at the end, we add a final key XOR. So this is why we have 32 round keys, not 31. OK, so assume that we have a plain text here. Then we say that, okay, let's make a small change on this plain text. So let's flip one bit or two. So how it affects this key addition layer, substitution layer, and the permutation layer. So let's focus on this one. So let's focus on constructing a differential characteristic or a differential distinguisher. So assume that we are encrypting two inputs, uh, inputs i and i prime with difference alpha. So this means that I, uh, alpha is the difference you introduce. So it might be a single bit flip, or it might be more than one bit flip. But once you XOR i with alpha, you obtain i prime. So uh, you have to, uh, for, uh, for, for, you, have, you shouldn't forget this in differential cryptanalysis. We are now working on two inputs, not one. So this is why we have i and i prime. But they are very related. Their difference, in other words, their, their XOR is just alpha, which is most of the time uh, a lot of zeros and a few ones. Consider the effects of the key addition, substitution, and permutation layers. So let's start with the key addition. So uh, don't forget that we are independently uh, encrypting two different inputs, i and i prime. So at the key addition layer, you are exhorting your i with the first round key, also your i prime with the first round key, since we are using the same key for encryption of two different plaintext. Since both inputs are encrypted with the same key, their difference is still the same. So recall that we had i xor i prime equal to alpha, but this time after the key addition layer, the, we don't know the key, so we don't know what i xor k is because we don't know k. We also don't know what I prime XOR K is because still we don't know the K, but we still know that after this layer, their XOR is the same because uh, the XOR operation is modulo two operation. Ks cancel each other. You end up with I XOR I prime, which is still alpha. So this means that if you introduce an input difference to a 
input. Then after the key addition layer, that doesn't change because key addition in present is just XOR operation. So the tricky part is actually the substitution layer. We don't know the exact values of S, I, XOR, K because we don't know the input, even though we know the S box. Since we don't know the input, we cannot know the output. And we also don't know I prime XOR, K. Again, we cannot uh, know the output of this S box operation. So we cannot exactly know the difference S I XOR K, XOR S I prime XOR K. But we can analyze the S box to see which input differences provide which output differences. So this would lead us to difference distribution tables. And actually the, the statistical part, the probabilities comes into play here. Okay, this is where the probabilities come into play and we will see how they are calculated. So as you can see, the tricky part is the substitution layer, which provides the confusion. But look, let's look at the permutation layer. Presence permutation layer only changes the places of the bits. So the, if the input has a, a non-zero difference at the i bit, then the output has a non-zero difference at pi bit. Pi is the permutation of the i bit. So for instance, assume that you have an input, uh, I, you perform the XOR and S box operations. So at the end, this bit is zero. Let's assume this is the case. And for I prime, you perform the same operation. And just for uh, pro with probability one, assume that the, uh, here you had the bit value one. So in one case, you have zero. In the other one, it is one. So their XOR is one. So your difference is one here. But after the permutation layer, both of those bits go to the same place, so the difference stays here. But if it were here, you will take those values there, so it will be here. So a permutation layer actually changes the places of the differences. So again, permutation layer does not introduce uh, complications to us. The only problem comes from the substitution. We cannot guess the output difference after the SBox operation. For this reason, we have to uh, perform a differential analysis of the S box. So let's look at presence S box. Consider every possible X, Y input pairs with X, X or Y equals to I. So this I value will range from one to F. But for a fixed I, let's focus all of the possible input pairs X, Y. And count the output differences where X, S, X, X or S, Y equals to J and construct a table with this count as the IJ entry. So we, we have done this for present. So these are the input differences I's, and these are the output differences J's. So what does this mean? As you can see, the table has a lot of zeros, some twos and fours, and at the beginning, uh, it has 16. So let's see why this is the case. If you choose I equals to zero, this means that x, x, or y equals to zero. This means that x equals to y. So consider every possible uh, input pair x, x. So after the S box operation, uh, s, x, x, or s, x would be zero too. So you, have, you will observe zero 16 times, and you wouldn't observe any other values. So let's look at one. So once you fix i equals to one, now you have to consider every possible x, y input pairs, which has the difference one. So if you start from zero, when you say x equals to zero, y has to be one because their x or should be one. If you take x equals to one, y should be zero. So this way you will range x from every possible 16 values, XOR it with i and obtain the y, then uh, perform the S, X and S, Y operation, XOR them, look at the output, and uh, it will be some value J, then increment the value of J in the table. As you can see, the values in this table are, all of them are even values. So uh, this is not a coincidence. You can see why. For instance, uh, think about a value J. So assume that S, X, X or S, Y equals to three, let's say. So for the pair X, Y, you ob observe the value three, but if, if you switch the places of X and Y, for the input pair Y, X, you will also observe 
3 because XORing SX, sorry, SX XOR SY will be equal to SY XOR SX. So for this reason, you will always observe even values in this table. And uh, for us, the uh, for the designer, smaller is better because uh, this table is means as follows. For instance, input difference four in the hexadecimal notation provides the output difference five four times. So there were possible 16 values and four of them is five. So this has probability four over 16, which is two to the minus two. So as the attacker, if this number is large, then you can easily guess what is the output difference. But if this is small, then it is harder for the attacker. So for the designer, we want small values. As the attacker, we want high values. So this actually raises a question, what is the best S box? How can I make this table so that uh, all the values I observe are zeros and twos? And because this fours means that higher uh, probabilities. So the highest values in the DT, DDT table, this is called the difference distribution table, except of course the first entry, which is always two to the N, where N is the dimension of your S box. So if it is a, a six by six X box, this will have the value two to the six, okay? So, so this is fixed and we are not interested in this, but we are interested in the rest of this table. So the highest value in the DDT is called differential uniformity. Again, as a designer, we want small differential uniformity. As the attacker, we want high differential uniformity. High differential uniformity provides characteristics with high probability, has lower is better for the designer. Values in DDT is even because the pairs XY and YX provide the same difference. Thus, the theoretically best achievable difference uniformity is two. So theoretically, this is the base. Question is, can I obtain in practice? For odd n, we can construct such n by n s boxes where differential uniformity is two. But for even values, this is there is a problem. For instance, for n equals to four, there is no such an S box. So there is no four by four S box with differential uniformity two. So for this reason, presence S box is not a bad one. They chose the uh, one of the best ones. So since we didn't have this, and we observed this value by actually uh, checking every possible four by four S box, of course, not one by one, but we classify them into equivalence classes and we checked if any class has such an S box and it is observed that there is no such S box. But the problem is that we cannot uh, exhaustively search this, uh, we cannot exhaustively search uh, bigger S boxes like six by six, eight by eight and so on. But for some time, for a very long time, since we couldn't get uh, differential two uniform uh, four by four S box, people thought that probably for even S boxes, this is not possible. But uh, something surprising happened in 2010. Dylan found the two uniform for uh, six by six S box. Now, uh, uh, it raises a bigger question. Can you find a two uniform eight by eight S box? Because a yes uses an eight by eight S box and it is a very good S box, but it is four uniform. So big open problem, which is uh, open since 2010. Uh, can you find the two uniform eight by eight S box? So we don't know the answer to this question. So you can either prove there's no such an S box or you can uh, prove that such an S box exists. And if you provide an, if you can provide an example for such an S box, it would be very useful for uh, cryptographic algorithm design. So let's go back to presence S box. There are some design criteria for the choice of presence S box. For instance, it is differentially four uniform. This is the best you can get for a four by four S box. For instance, they could choose a six uniform or eight uniform S box. Sometimes we do it. Even we know that we lose some security here. We might choose such an S box because it might be easier to implement on a hardware. So you might make a trade off between uh, security and performance. 
They also chose this S box so that it has no fixed points. In other words, there are no X values such that X equals to SX. Some S boxes has this value. And most of the time we are trying to avoid fixed points because for instance, if such a thing exists, this means that this layer does not provide any confusion for that input. And they also make this uh, choice. One bit input difference never provides a one bit output difference. So for any input difference where X, X or Y equals to one, two, four, eight in hexadecimal notation, you will never observe S, X, X or S, Y as one, two, four or eight. So you can also see this in the DDT table. For instance, let's look at one. And as you can see for the input difference one, you don't observe that difference one, two, four or eight. Uh, this applies for other one bit differences too. So this is a design criteria. And this is a good thing because if such a thing existed, for instance, if the input difference one provides the output difference one for a high probability, uh, a distinguisher you can obtain is as follows. Only give the input difference to the rightmost bits. And since uh, we assume that this uh, one input difference goes to one output difference with very high probability and the permutation layer doesn't affect it. So if you only give input difference to this bit, most probably in the next round, you will still have the same thing. And for the next round and so on. So for high probability, you can obtain a, a very long differential characteristic with this. So this is why they made the, they have this precaution. Okay. So let's see uh, what is done in the literature. One of the best differential attacks are produced by Wang. And uh, in their paper, uh, they also uh, provide some uh, iterative uh, differential characteristics. Let's see how they work. And uh, then we can think about uh, how we can use it to construct a, a distinguisher by using this property. 